Hey folks, I'm Spencer and on today's episode of Court Mania we're going to be looking at the ultimate cage rage movie, Panos Cosmatos' Mandy. Now, Mandy came out in 2018, which for me is probably the best year for films that I've lived through. And I actually reviewed Mandy back then and it tied three ways for the best film of 2018. I haven't been back to that review, so let's see whether Mandy still holds up now all the hype has died down. Mandy follows Nick Cage as played by Red and Andrea Riceborough as the titular Mandy. They're a couple that live out in the middle of nowhere, isolated from everyone, but seeming pretty happy with that. They've both clearly run away from something in their past, but have now seemed to find peace together. That peace is then shattered when their home is invaded by the children of the New Dawn, a cult run by Jeremiah Sands, played by Linus Roach. He's a failed singer who's taken one too many pages out of the Charles Manson handbook. After this invasion, it's up to Red to go and seek revenge on the cult and the Black Skulls. They're sort of weird, coked up biker gang henchmen that look like Cenobites. Cenobikers, if you will. Now, you're probably going to think that I've absolutely lost the plot when I tell you that a film with chainsaw fights and a battle axe inspired by the Celtic Frost logo is a real emotional powerhouse. But it is, trust me. Mandy and Red, as played by Cage and Riseborough, carry so much emotional weight. They're really subtle and nuanced performances, at least to start with. In any of the scenes where they're together, they speak so gently to one another. Like, Nick Cage's Red makes really awful sort of dad jokes. It's, it's really nice to just be in their company and to see a relationship between older characters. Originally, Red was supposed to be a much younger character, but I think it really works that they're that much later in life, that you really get the sense that they have lived difficult lives but have found each other and found happiness in doing so. Under the crimson primordial sky, the wretched warlock reached into the dark embrace. And even when we're going into this dark territory of what their past might have been like, it still feels really subtle. In the opening scene, Red refuses a beer from a co-worker and later on you see that he finds beer hidden away in the bathroom. This sort of gives you a sense that he's probably had alcohol problems, but it's never overtly said. There is no point in which he goes, oh, I haven't had a drink in so long. And I think that's really important. Similarly, Riseborough gives this great little monologue about an event in Mandy's childhood, and it's not graphic, but it tells you everything you need to know about her character and where she's come from. And I think it's one of the best monologues, one of the best performances in recent horror movies. Then you have Linus Roach playing Jeremiah Sant, who manages to be, in one scene, he can be grandiose, violent, pathetic. He can switch between them at the drop of a hat, and I think it's a really great performance because it genuinely, like, he can snap at any moment, and it can really catch an audience off guard. It genuinely makes you think he's just a weirdo. To be honest though, all the performances in the film are really, really good. There are so many little weird side characters that turn up for, you know, one or two scenes, and they're all really great. You could kind of imagine them being their own protagonist in a different film. I mean, Bill Duke from Predator turns up in one scene, and in that one scene, he became one of my favourite side characters in anything ever. So what you want? It's crazy! Evil. Then of course you get to the second half of the film and all that tenderness I was talking about goes completely out the window and we start lopping off heads, you know, this is the point in which it becomes the Nick Cage film I think everyone expected it to be. <laughs> but even when we get into these sort of more violent, more over-the-top sequences, there is still that emotional weight carried over from the start of the film. And even, even in crazy Nick Cage mode, 
he's still doing a more in-depth performance than I think a lot of people were expecting. There's a scene where he stood in a bathroom in his pants and he goes from screaming in anger to just crying in desperation and it's so human, it's so realistic. Most people, when they go out to go and get revenge, they become so focused, they become like a machine. No, it, he's a person going through something you could never imagine. And that scene is the perfect way of showing it. It is, like, it's become parodied now, but I think, I think it's so good and it packs so much emotional heft. This isn't to say it isn't freaking great to see Nick Cage go full-blown nutcase. I mean, this is a film where I think the perfect image that sums up the second half of the film is Nick Cage picking up a mountain of cocaine, snorting it off a shard of glass. I mean, who doesn't want to see that? This guy does. But you've always got that bit of emotional weight behind it, and especially as the film comes towards its climax, that emotion really comes back through. The film is an absolute visual feast. It looks so good. There is not a frame of this film that you can't look at and go, oh wow, that looks pretty. I mean, it's shot digitally on widescreen, but all of the colour grading has gone into making this look retro. There is a lot of incredibly fat film grain on it, which if you've been on this channel before, you know, this guy loves some film grain. But even without that, I mean, it's so effectively shot. There are some fantastic points where you're just staring into people's faces. There's a wonderful shot where two faces meld together and then they go back into being separate and then they come back together. And it's so freaky. But I mean, it's such a colourful film as well. You've got these beautiful reds, blues and purples. There's a bit at a lake with this lovely turquoise water. It's just, like I said, it's a visual feast. Cosmatos uses this technique called panoflaring, which is to aim usually small LEDs into the corner of the lens and it just washes out the image, but it coats it in this lovely colour. It gives it this sort of dreamlike sort of mystical feel to it and it suits the film so well. As well as the fantastic real world visuals, you have to also admire the fact that there are these lovely intertitles that are put in like... I mean the film's title doesn't turn up until about halfway through and then it's in the most like black metal font ever, it's awesome. And then you get these sort of heavy metal cartoon sequences, these sort of dream sequences that are done in animation and again they just look so cool and it's awesome that the world starts to shift and change more as the film goes on to mimic the style of those cartoons but in the real world. I mean it's just so metal and it's so awesome. I've seen a lot of people complain that Mandy is just style over substance but the style is so inherently connected to the substance, in my mind, that you can't... You can't film Mandy and it looked like this video right now where I'm just sat in, you know... If Nick Cage was just sat in a room with normal white light on, it would have none of the impact because this heightened sense of the world gives you such a heightened sense of emotion. And even if you don't buy that and you do think it's more style over substance, who cares? Let people watch a film where every shot could be the cover of a black metal album, you boring... Now, the soundtrack. I do realise that this is a black on black cover and it's probably not shown up on the camera, but... It looks cool if you can see it in person. The score for Mandy was composed by the late Johan Johansson, and I think it actually might have been one of the last projects he worked on. And, I mean, what a soundtrack. It is so good. It's like Black Sabbath and John Carpenter decided to do a collaboration album, and then someone played it at half speed because they didn't think it was heavy enough yet. I... It... I mean, it seems really strange to have one of the greatest composers of his generation work on a scuzzy little film like Mandy, but it shows that 
just shows how much score adds to a film. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's the love theme, which is just this sort of... It's like having sort of just a peaceful mood wash over you as these sort of guitars reverberate around, or whether it's these crushing drums that appear on a track like Waste, or the so heavy droning guitars that Stephen O'Malley from Sun brings to a track like Burning Church. It just, it hits perfectly with everything that's on screen and it works so well outside of the film as well but I think it's just how well everything marries up it, I mean this goes for everything in the film everything just merges perfectly into creating this bizarre intense world and the soundtrack is so key to that I mean I am fanboying all over this thing because I've probably listened to this soundtrack more than any other soundtrack in recent memory. I'm surprised that vinyl actually has grooves on it anymore. I've played it that often. If I walk anywhere, it's one of my go-to bits of walking music. It is such a good score. Even if you don't watch the film, go and listen to the soundtrack, please. The cosmic darkness. I have to say, Mandy just gets better every time you watch it. it there is so much that you get out of a repeat viewing on it. There are so many little things that you notice that you... I think the first time you watch it, it's so overwhelming that you don't notice the cool little plot details or the, you know, silly, overly metal names of things like the Horn of Abraxas. It, it just... It's such a good film to just sit and let sort of soak into you. And I love that... Mandy is Mandy. It is a film I can't really compare it to anything else. It has its own logic, it has its own tone and I can understand that that can be quite off-putting. I've seen people say that it's too arty for its own good to which I do wonder whether they got as far as watching, you know, Nick Cage fight weird Cenobite bikers with an axe because I'm like that is just too cool but I think it's the fact that perhaps people were just expecting Nick Cage going on a rampage I think that was what I was expecting the first time I didn't expect it to have such emotional depth to I could I could happily have just watched a film that is red and mandy before everything horrible happens if it looks like this and it had their performances. I would just happily spend time with them. I just think it's great. I really do. I cannot wait to see what Cosmatos does next. I hope... I don't want a Mandy 2, but I would kind of like something set in the same universe. I would like to just be in this weird dreamscape more. I mean, I feel like I'm not doing the film enough justice. It's still so good. I'm glad that I put it as a, one of the best films of 2018 because it really, really is. But that's just my opinion. Have you seen Mandy? What did you think of it? Let me know down in the comments. Like and subscribe so you don't miss any more videos. Anyway, I'm off to go and play the soundtrack to Mandy one more time. So I'll see you next time.